All right, well, hey, good morning to you, Story Church. It is great to be with you this morning. Um, hey, my name is Ken Anderson. If we don't know each other, we'd love to get to know you at some point uh, later this morning. Uh, I have the honor of being one of the elders here at Story Church, though vocationally, I'm a teacher. I teach eighth grade uh, English language arts. And, and just a little heads up here. So over the last 24 hours or so, I've, I've started to lose my voice a little bit. So if at some point my voice cracks like one of my eighth graders, okay, you will know why, okay? In addition to being a teacher, I'm a husband to the lovely Amy Anderson. We are uh, getting pretty close here to 20 years of marriage. Thank you, yes. I'm feeling pretty good about it too. Uh, And then I am a father to Evan who is 15 and a half, and that half is important, and Caitlin who just turned 13. Uh, Most importantly, I am a sinner saved by grace. And so I'm honored, I'm humbled to stand before you this morning and share from God's word. We're gonna be in Psalm 103, Psalm 103. Would love for you to turn there if you've got you know, a paper Bible, or if you want to navigate there, if you've got, you know, phone or whatever device. Uh, I like to preach tethered to the text. So just be really helpful if you have uh, the Word of God right before your eyes. We'll try to have as much as we can on the screen. But if you can have it right before your eyes, that'll be great. If you don't own a Bible, we would love to gift you with one. Typically, there are Bibles on tables in the back. They're, they're somewhere. Uh, you are welcome. You could go grab one right now. And if you're like, oh, it would be kind of awkward to stand up right now and go grab a Bible, uh, you can certainly grab one on your way out. You're, you're welcome to grab one now. It's not a big deal. Uh, but we'd love to gift you with one of those. Or if uh, you don't have a Bible in front of you, if you want to just grab your phone and Google Psalm 103. That works. We're going to be in the ESV translation, so uh, find that, or you could download an app real quick. Get to your app store. Uh, the one I like best is Version, Y-O-U Version. Download that real quick and get to Psalm 103 uh, so you can have God's Word before you. We have a tradition here of standing for the reading of God's Word. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, if God has spoken, uh, we, we ought to listen, right? And we believe that He has spoken and is speaking through His Word, uh, and His Word tells us who He is. Look at you. You're like a good class. You're already standing. Sure, go for it. Let's, let's make it happen. Yes, we believe he's spoken through his word about who he is, why he created us, what went wrong, and what he's done through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to make it right. So, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, Well, Father, here we are with your word uh, before us. And I simply ask that you would do uh, what you have promised in your word to do, uh, that your word would go forth and not return void. I pray you do abundantly more than we could ask or imagine this morning. Would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive uh, what you desire to impress upon us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're welcome to have a seat. Thank you, thank you. Uh, We are, as many of you know, in this summer series called A Summer in the Psalms. Uh, Each of us has been asked to pick a psalm that in some way changed our our lives. And so, so why... 
Why Psalm 103? Well, I came to faith in Jesus just before I turned 20, and I came to faith in Jesus out of a life of of drinking and partying and pleasure-seeking and chasing girls and living for immediate gratification, no regard for God whatsoever. So I don't have time to give you all the details of the story, but but those are the the broad strokes. And so I ended up having one of these really dramatic uh, conversion experiences uh, near the end of the summer of 19. 99. And so it's getting close to 25 years of walking with Jesus for me. And yet, over that time, there has been this perpetual pattern uh, in my life, namely this, this tendency to just drift away from God. And then to have Him time and again and again and again and again and again graciously draw me back to Himself. And you might think that, gosh, after 25 years, Uh, you know, this tendency to drift away from God, shouldn't that have kind of gone away? Uh, I wish it had, but it it just simply hasn't. And so while the details of what what I tend to drift toward might be different than what you tend to drift toward, my guess is that if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, you can can resonate a bit with what I'm I'm talking about. It feels like my life is sort of like, uh, if you've ever had the experience of going to like a grocery store or Target or something, and you get one of those shopping carts that has the one bad wheel, and so it is a battle to get that thing to go straight. Right? You really have to work to get that thing to go in a straight line. As you push, it is just wanting so badly to veer. If you were to push it perfectly straight and let go, it would almost immediately veer to the side. Right? And so it feels like my life is kind of like that. And, and I know where I'm supposed to be going. I know where my focus is supposed to be. And yet, there's just this stubborn tendency to drift. And then to, to push the analogy a little bit further, it doesn't help that as, as we walk through life, it's as though there is aisle after aisle after aisle of tempting things that look desirable and shiny and tasty and so forth, that are vying for my attention, and the cart is already seeming to drift that way. And so this this has been my life experience. And so why Psalm 103? Well, Psalm 103 helps me to understand why that tendency is there. It helps me to get underneath and understand what's going on there. What, What are the sort of the mechanics of this? And it helps me to understand What can I do about it? How can I proactively fight that tendency? How do I respond to it? How do I get out in front of it? And so what we're gonna learn from Psalm 103 is why we're so prone to wander from God and how, how to fight that tendency. In other words, what are the tools he's given us? What are the means of grace that he uses to keep us moving toward him and to keep us from drifting away? In other words, Psalm 103 is in a sense God's playbook It's his playbook for how to focus and sort of heat your heart toward him. So let's take a look. Verse one and two. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, what we have here is the reason we tend to drift from God. Did you notice it in verse two? What is it? It's actually strikingly simple. We forget God. We don't, we don't remember him. Now, before we go any further, there are two things you need to understand because some of you are thinking, that's it? Like you were hoping for something more insightful, right? Something that, that would strike you as maybe being more illuminating than just that we forget God. So two things we need to know. When we read forget not, okay, forget not. The idea here in Psalm 103 specifically and, and the Bible as a whole more generally, the idea of forget not, or if we were to state it positively, to remember The idea is much more than mere sort of mental recall. It's much more than that. Okay, what is it? What does it mean then to forget not or to remember? Really, the idea is to be gripped by something, to to be taken by something. It means that something is so pressed into the core of your being that it it has a controlling uh, element to it. It it impacts how you think, what you desire, uh, how you act. This is what it means to remember. Now, if you're like, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? Let's take a look at verse 14, okay? Same psalm. Let's jump ahead for a moment to verse 14, and it says this. For he, and it's talking about God here, for he knows our frame, or could be translated, he knows how we are formed. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. Okay, now when we read that God remembers that we are dust, are we meant to imagine that God is up there going, oh, oh yeah, that's right, that's right. (sighs) Almost forgot. (laughs) They're dust, whew, Okay, no, of course not. God is omniscient. So for God to remember something cannot be just mere 
mental recall. So then, what it, well, what is it? There's that little crack. I told you it was coming. Uh, what is it to, to uh, remember them? Well, little language arts teacher moment here. Can, can I have just a moment as an English teacher here? Uh, Hebrew poetry, Old Testament's written in Hebrew. Hebrew poetry leans very heavily on the use of parallelism as a literary device. Okay, what's, what's parallelism? What's that mean? It simply means it's very common in Hebrew writing, especially in the Psalms and the Proverbs, to have two lines that aim to communicate the same truth. And so line two reinforces line one. Line two clarifies line one. Line two uh, you know, sheds further light on line one. So let's notice what's happening here with the parallelism. It says, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. So for God to remember is not mere mental recall, it's synonymous with no. And so what we have here then is a perfect insight into what the Bible means when it calls us to forget not or to remember. It's to know something at the core of your being. It's to have something so central to your consciousness that it has a controlling impact. Now that's one thing you need to know at the outset, to forget not. Here in verse 2 of Psalm 103, in the Bible more generally, to, to remember is to have something so pressed into who you are, so, so central to your core, so central to the essence of who you are, that it impacts how you think, how you live, what you desire. What's the second thing we need to know? Okay? Because what I'm trying to help us to see here is that what Psalm 103 is showing us is the reason that we tend to drift, the reason we tend to wander. The old hymn says it perfectly. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. And so Psalm 103, again, verses one and, two, uh, one and two, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So here's the second thing you need to know. This truth, this idea that we forget God, that without intentionality, we won't remember him, uh, is found throughout scripture. This is not unique here in Psalm 103. So for example, you see this especially, though not exclusively, in the book of Deuteronomy. God has delivered the people from Egypt in all sorts of miraculous ways. He's led them through the wilderness and they have, they have seen firsthand miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Things that you would think, how could you possibly forget? And yet, Notice what God says to them on repeat as they are on the verge, on the brink of entering the promised land. Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart, that core of who you are. Chapter 4, verse 23. Take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. Chapter six, starting in verse 10. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of all good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Chapter eight, verse 10. And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So, so you see, God is telling us that it's when, it's when circumstances are pretty good, it's when life is, is relatively easy that we are most prone to forget him. It's when we're not coming fresh off the felt experience of his love and grace that we are most prone to forget. I mean, when I was first saved, I was thinking about God all the time. Just God, 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 God. I was buying WWJD bracelets. That was the thing back then. Uh, I was talking to people eagerly about him. I was immersing myself in the things of God. Uh, but after some time passed, 
after that mountaintop high experience sort of started to fade and dissipate, uh, after there was some distance between that felt experience of God's love and grace, that's when I began to fixate less and less on him and more and more on other things. And so, to summarize, what we have here is the first major lesson of this psalm. Our problem is that we tend to drift from God. Why? Why do we do that? Because we are prone to forget, to not remember, to not have God, his love, his beauty, at the causal core of who we are. God consciousness is not automatic. It has to be cultivated intentionally. And so perhaps an analogy will help. I heard this from John Piper years ago. Think of the solar system. Of course, the sun is at the center, as it should be. And because the sun is at the center, all the planets uh, are, are held in their proper orbit. Everything functions as it should. Okay, apply that to life. God is meant to be at the center of our solar system. And when God is at the center, when he's, when he's most important, when he's the thing, then all the other sort of planets, finances, uh, marriage, parenting, job, hobbies, friendships, et cetera, et cetera, all those things are in their proper place. Things just kinda, kinda work. But as soon as you take one of those other things and, and move it to the center, and it becomes the thing, the most important thing, really quickly things start to spiral out of control. And things just don't work the way that they should. And so I, I just know, in my own life experience, there is this ongoing battle for sort of experiential kingship, experiential supremacy in my heart. Right, like, like what, what do I praise? What do I esteem? What, uh, what, what grips me? What, uh, what am I fixated on? Uh, where do I look for satisfaction? Where do I, where do I derive a sense of identity? What's, what's important to me? What do I truly value? What do I love most? Uh, what dominates my thinking? What controls my consciousness? What, what's at the, at the center? And I can tell you, and here's where the, the details of my own life and experience are gonna probably differ from yours, but I can tell you what some of those things are that, that sort of vie for the supremacy of my heart. Uh, one is sports. Uh, life can very easily orbit around sports, especially about mid-March. About mid-March, man, my thoughts really get fixated on sports. Physical fitness and appearance, that can easily become a major idol in my life. Uh, most recently, it's a new car. And so I mentioned uh, our son is 15 and a half. And so he just a couple weeks ago got his learner's permit. And uh, the plan for, for many, many months has been, years really, has been that when he starts driving, we are passing on our 2007 Toyota Highlander to him as his first car. Now we got this car actually shortly after we found out that we were pregnant with him. So it's kind of cool, it comes full circle. We've had this car all these years, we're gonna pass this thing on to him. Now he's not nearly as excited to have it as we are for him to have it, but it's now his car. So we've been preparing, we're gonna get, have to replace this car and we've got solar panels. So it's like, let's, I think we should probably do an electric vehicle. So we recently bought a new car, maybe three weeks ago or so. And, uh, you know, the 07 Highlander is a great car. I would gladly drive that car, if we weren't passing it on to him, gladly drive that car till the wheels fell off. Terrific car. He would probably like that I keep the car and give him the new one, but that's not happening. Um, <clears throat> and so, here's the thing. An 07 Highlander, none of the modern sort of tech features that come with uh, cars now. Right, there's, there's no backup camera, there's no touch screen, there's no USB ports, there's no, you know, uh, Apple CarPlay, CarPlay, Android Auto. I have an Android, so I don't know what I'm talking about with the Apple stuff, but um, you can make fun of me later. Uh, it's got none of that stuff, okay? It has a six CD changer, and I kid you not, a cassette tape deck. Okay, now, yes, yes. So if you don't know what a cassette tape is, then after the service, find someone who's about 40 or so and above, and they, they can explain that to you. Okay, so now we've gone to this car that's got all these tech features, backup cameras, touch screen, lane departure warning signals, and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it just blows my mind. It's like if I, for the last 15 years, had stubbornly held on to a flip phone, and then all of a sudden was like, all right, I'll upgrade, and got the, the newest iPhone. Like, the jump is so significant. So it is so easy right now for that to become the center of my, my solar system. It's so easy for me to fixate on uh, this new car. Now, what Psalm 103 is helping us to see is that if we're not intentional, good things will become ultimate things. Good things will become ultimate things. And there are at least two problems with that. Uh, one, those good things, I mean, really, they just don't last. 
right? So, so John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. For all that is in the world, the desires of the, uh, of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Jesus said it this way. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, so, so what's, what's center, right? I mean, the car's great, but it's not going to last, right? And, and all the cool features that I'm so amazed with right now, within a couple years, certainly within like 10 years, they won't seem so impressive at all anymore. I mean, it was not that long ago, not that long ago, that the iPhone 4, Four was the most amazing thing available, right? And so these things just don't last. Here's the second problem with forgetting God and letting good things become ultimate things. Uh, Really, in a lot of ways, that's the essence of sin. Trading God for something else as God. And so Romans chapter one, so insightful uh, in, in this regard. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and here it is, exchanged, there's a trade, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for uh, images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they, here it is again, exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Good things becoming ultimate things. Okay, so, so there's the problem. We tend to drift from God. We're, we're like that shopping cart with the, the, the bad wheel. Why, why do we drift? Because without intentionality, we tend to forget God. We let other things move to the center of our solar system. Now, does Psalm 103 offer us a prescription? Does it offer us a solution? Does it tell us how to fight this tendency? Does it tell us how to remember God, to not forget him, how to keep our hearts fixated on him? Yes, 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 it does. What do we learn from Psalm 103 about how to remember God? What do we learn about how to keep our hearts fixated on him? Uh, We learn three things, okay? Uh, All of them require being intentional, being deliberate, not being passive. Years ago, I was at a, a men's breakfast. There was maybe 30 of us, and the gentleman who was speaking that morning uh, started off, and he said, okay, let me, let me begin this way. Let me ask you guys, show of hands. Uh, you don't have to actually raise your hands, okay, it's just a story. He said, uh, show of hands, how many of you men would say that your relationship with God and becoming the man that he desires you to be is the most important thing in your life? And basically, every hand in the room went up. And he said, okay, keep your hands up for a second, keep them up. Okay, now keep your hands up if you have an actual plan for how to make that happen. And gradually, almost every single hand in the room went down. And so there is uh, an intentionality that is called for in this psalm. Three things. Here's number one. Again, verses one and two. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What is it? We see it three times. Bless the Lord. What does it mean to bless the Lord? Well, the word could also be translated praise or to to speak well of. So the call here is to live a life of intentional praise, to be deliberate about praising God regularly. Now, you might say, I don't know, that just doesn't seem authentic. I mean, I just, I kind of feel like I should only praise God when I feel a desire to. Otherwise, it feels a little bit fake. I should only really, you know, I should only, only do this sort of act of love if I feel like it. And so let me just say that if you're married, I hope you don't relate to your spouse that way. I hope you don't only act lovingly to your spouse when you feel a desire to do so. I hope you act lovingly to your spouse even when you don't feel like it. And if you're a parent, the same could, uh, could be said there as well, right? I mean, how often do you feel like changing a diaper? How often do you feel like making yet another box of mac and cheese, right? And so let's get over this notion that uh, we should only praise God when we feel a desire to do so. Choose to praise God and the feelings will follow. Act and let your emotions catch up. 
Now, very practically, very practically, let me command as one way to increase your regular praise of God, a very simple, very doable practice that you could implement beginning today, okay? Very simply, play worship music as often as possible, right? Because you know how this works with music. Uh, You're driving to work or something like that. There's music playing. uh, And right as you turn off the car, that last song, you know, you cut that off. And then what happens? You get out of the car and and often for the next few hours, that song is just replaying in your head. And you find yourself singing along, humming along. That song is just sort of lodged in there. And so, so leverage that. I found in my own experience over the last year or so in particular, uh, that having worship music on uh, as often as I can, even as background, is, is sort of heating up my heart toward God in ways that are, that are unique. And so while you're driving, while you're cooking, that box of mac and cheese, uh, while you're changing a diaper, while you're exercising, while you're getting ready in the morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, make worship music the soundtrack of your life. Okay, so number one, be intentional about praise. Number two, did you notice who this psalm is addressed to? Uh, Who's the audience for this psalm? Who's he talking to? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who's he talking to? He's talking to himself. I mean, many of the psalms are addressed to the people of God. Many psalms are addressed to God directly. Uh, Not this psalm. He's talking to himself. It's like he's grabbing himself by the shirt and saying, hey, this is what you need to be doing. This is not gentle. Uh, This is not passive. This is radically intentional. And so, so what's the lesson? Here it is. Talk to yourself. Don't just listen to yourself. You you know there's a difference, right? Because our minds are just constantly going. Thoughts are just constantly churning. And most of the time, we're just sort of passively listening and just letting those thoughts just sort of wander wherever they happen to wander. And, and, And there's that problem again, right? This tendency to just drift, to wander. Uh, And so uh, the the scriptures have much to say about uh, being deliberate about what we think about. Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things, set your minds on things that are are above, not on things that are on the earth. Uh, Romans 12, 2, we just heard it uh, for Will. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? How do you get transformed? By the renewal of your mind. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So don't just let your mind wander aimlessly. Get a grip. Talk to yourself. Preach to yourself. What do you talk to yourself about? Where do you intentionally direct your mind's focus? Well, number three. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I mean, isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, forget not his character. He says, forget not all his benefits. And so do you see how this works? You you bless the Lord for all his benefits, all the good he has done for you and is doing for you. And in reflecting on all his benefits, all the good he has done and is doing for you, your uh, affections are stirred to bless the Lord. They're mutually reinforcing. Now, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of God that the psalmist deliberately calls himself to remember and think about? They begin in verse three. Here they are. Who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, jumping to verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Where in the world are you going to find a better longer lasting package of benefits. Now how, how are you to go about regularly, deliberately, intentionally bringing these benefits before you? How are you going to go go about getting your soul repeatedly reoriented around God so that that your, your sort of life orbits around him? Well, the best guide for me has been a man named George Mueller. 
Uh, George Mueller, I was wearing a George Mueller t-shirt the other day when I was with Sean. He lived in the 1800s. He looks a little bit like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he was born in Germany, quick bio, uh, uh, was a missionary in London, England for the majority of his life. Uh, he was a pastor. He was the head of a missions organization, but he's best known for the work that he did caring for orphans. And so this is before the foster care system there in the 1800s in, in London. And there were scores of children just living on the streets. And George Mueller and his, his wife were burdened for these kids. And so they began feeding kids as many as they could breakfast on a regular basis. Uh, breakfast turned into breakfast and lunch. And then it turned into three meals a day. And then it turned into more and more kids. And then they opened up an orphan house and housed kids 24-7 and cared for them 24-7. One orphan house over the years became two, became three. Uh, by the end of his life, George Mueller cared for 10,000 plus orphans. I mean, you think you've got a lot of kids and a lot going on. 10,000 plus orphans. So here's a, guy, here's a guy with a lot happening. He's pastoring a church. He's the head of a missions organization. He's running these orphanages. Very busy man. Here's how he says he lives or lived his life. Okay, George Mueller. The first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. According to my judgment, the most important point to be attended to is this. Above all things, see to it that your souls are happy in the Lord. Other things may press upon you. The Lord's work may even have urgent claims upon your attention. But I deliberately repeat, it is of supreme and paramount importance that you should seek above all things to have your, your souls truly happy in God himself. Day by day, seek to make this the most important business of your life. Now, how did George Mueller do this? How did he make his soul happy in the Lord day by day? Here's what he says. As the outward man is not fit for work for any length of time unless he eats, so it is with the inner man. What is the food for the inner man? The word of God. Not the simple reading of the word of God so that it only passes through our minds just as water runs through a pipe. No, we must consider what we read, ponder over it, and apply it to our hearts. The vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. Now, really, he's just saying what Psalm 103 is saying, isn't he? Be intentional about putting the benefits of God before you and pressing them into your heart. Now, as, as we move toward a close this morning, uh, let's be sure to meditate on one final thing. Putting these benefits before you, praising God for them, uh, talking to yourself about them, remembering them, pressing them into the core of your being, all vitally important. But to really heat your heart, you've got to go one step further. To really make what's here central to your consciousness, you need to not only see the benefits of God, but what they cost to be made yours. And so let's close by taking our hearts to the place they must ultimately always go, the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ to secure these benefits for us. So let's just think it through. How is it, how is it that you can be forgiven of all your iniquity, as verse three says? How is it that you can have this benefit? It's that, as Isaiah 53, five tells us, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, that the sinless son of God willingly allowed stakes to be pounded through his hands and feet to forgive your iniquity. How is it that you can be healed of all your diseases? And that, that probably is a reference to the ultimate disease of sin because it's in parallel with the previous line. How is it that you can have this benefit? It's that, as Isaiah 53, 5 says, with his wounds, we are healed. How is it that your life can be redeemed from the pit? The pit is a metaphor for death or the grave. How is it that you can have this benefit? It's that, as Isaiah 53, 9 says, they made his grave with the wicked. He went to the pit to redeem you from the pit. How is it that you can be crowned with steadfast love and mercy? How is it that you can have this benefit? It's that, as John 19, 2 and 3 report, the soldiers twisted together a, a crown of thorns. And that crown pressed and dug and scraped into Jesus' skin so that blood flowed down into his eyes so that he could crown you with steadfast love and mercy. 
Uh, how is it that you can be satisfied with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, as verse five says. It's that as the song in Christ alone so, so eloquently puts it. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. How is it that as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us, as verse 12 tell, uh, tells us? How is it you can have this benefit? Where do those sins go? It's that as Isaiah 53, 6 tells us, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so let me close with a story. I heard this story years and years ago. A story about a pastor who had an elderly woman in his congregation, uh, quite elderly woman in his congregation. She came to him one particular Sunday at the end of the service, kind of pulled him aside, and she began to tell him that she had been having uh, these visions, very vivid visions of God, in which she believed that she was seeing God and hearing directly from him. So this pastor's standing there hearing this, and he's not quite sure what to do. Because you know, you know, you want to be encouraging, but you also kind of want to be guarded with things like this. It's quite a claim. So he's hearing what she's saying, and he's trying to figure out, where do I, where do I go with this? Is this woman just kind of maybe going senile? She's quite elderly. What do I do here? So he gets an idea, and he says, okay. He asks some questions and whatnot. He says, okay, I'll tell you what. Uh, can I have you ask God, next time you have one of these visions, can I have you ask God a specific question? She says, Sure. He says, okay, the next time you have one of these visions, I want you to ask God what it was that I confessed, what sins I confessed the last time I privately confessed my sins to him. I do this all the time, and so I'll I'll know what they are, but nobody else will. And he's feeling pretty clever, feeling, feeling pretty good about himself. He says, can you ask God that question next time you have one of these visions? And she says, yeah, I can do that. So a week or two goes by, and uh, end of a Sunday service, she pulls him aside. And she begins to describe that she's had another one of these visions. She's talking about what she saw and what God said. And the pastor says, okay, well, but did you remember to ask God what what I told you to ask him? She says, oh, yes, yes, I remembered. And I said to God, "Um, my pastor asked me to ask you this question. Uh, He asked me to ask what it was that pastor so-and-so confessed the last time he confessed his sins to you. The pastor smiled and kind of nodded his head and said, okay, well, I I certainly remember. And so what did God say to you? And she looked at him really intently. And she said, well, when I asked that, the corners of his lips turned up in a smile. His eyes began to water a little bit. And he said exactly this. Because of my son Jesus and what he accomplished, I don't remember. And so church, this is what we must remember what it cost him to forget. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Uh, You're an amazing God. (laughs) The list of your benefits could go on and on and on and on. I know it is so easy for me, and I imagine that this is true of uh, virtually everyone here, so easy for me to forget, uh, to not have you at the center of my life, the center of my solar system, to just drift. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to be intentional about praising you, to be intentional about talking to ourselves, to be intentional about remembering your benefits and especially remembering what they cost to be made ours. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.